guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Sitting up there with kids my own age and having Ilyasa asking us questions and actually wanting to hear our voice, you can't not just feel empowered and just heard. They're being introduced to new words and they're using them in their everyday language. They're talking to people in the hallways saying, hey, we have lemonade on Friday. Do you want to be a customer? Here you go. And I'm going to ask you all to take your left hand and grab your nose. I try to impress upon teachers that you know, from the brain's perspective, uh, learning does not happen from the neck up. It happens from the feet up. Ready, go. Try not to be afraid of them. They're more afraid of you than you are them. We wouldn't have fruits, vegetables without them. So there's the honey, huh? And honey. Everybody likes honey. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Classroom Close-Up New Jersey. I'm your host, Sean Spiller. Education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs only to the people who prepare for it today. Words we teachers live by. They were spoken in 1964. The speaker was Malcolm X. Less than a year later, he was silenced when assassins took his life, but his words live on. And while the context of the time was in support of the civil rights struggle, the general meaning continues to motivate our educational community. We're about to meet someone who personifies the spirit of those words and who has a special connection to their original speaker. Education is our passport to the future, empowering and inspiring young people along the way. Every year, thousands of educators attend the NJEA convention, two days packed with professional development workshops, resources, and presentations. This year, the theme is Standing Together. That starts with stronger public schools that work for every New Jersey child. With a focus on how social justice leads to student success. One of the featured speakers is educator, activist, and author Ilyasa Shabazz, daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz. Activism, I think, is really just a way everyone should live their lives. When we see injustice, it's our forward-thinking, smart, individual responsibility to correct. Activism is simply taking responsibility for life, right? For your life, for others, for the society in which we live. Her foundation for activism is rooted in childhood, motivated by lessons and cherished memories of her parents. What I remember of my father is that smile. I remember his voice. I remember him calling my name Ilyasa, and that would resonate with me because when I was a child, I was told I didn't listen, you know? And when my father would call me, that I would stop and give my attention to my father. Eliasa was two years old when her father was assassinated. Her mother raised six daughters alone, went back to college and earned a PhD, all the while remaining a central figure in Eliasa's life. My mother didn't focus on raising us, understanding racism or sexism or any of these things. She focused on raising us so that we loved ourselves because in order for you to be compassionate when you see someone being treated unfairly, you had to first be happy and comfortable with who you were. When you look at empowerment and, and activism, how do we empower people in this new political world? Well, I think it's really great, first of all, that young people being able to communicate with people all across the world, they're able to see facts instead of just being told information. They can go and research and find out you know, to have these discussions and figure out solutions together. I would think that we would want all of our children to play an active role in, you know, being leaders, making sure that when they see something that's wrong, that they want to, they want to address it, they want to fix it, they want to correct it. So let's give our young people a round of applause. The active role of young people was on display when student leaders were invited to address concerns and propose solutions to a room full of educators. We met some young students who basically taught for that moment and they instructed all of the educators how to be better in the classroom. I think joy and passion is something that we lack in our educational system today just because it's 
so structured, like for example, standardized testing. Uh, students are like so focused on that to perform well on them. A lot of educational policies and systems, they're based on school policymakers, but then you never really get to hear the student voice and their perspective on these types of things. And I think it's really important to say what you want to say and tell educators what you think. If we can, you know, customize um, technology, we should also be customizing schools and the classroom itself. So we need more wow. collaboration instead of competition. They're young, they're learning. We're responsible for guiding them. We're responsible for giving something back to them. And just to see them engage, to see them, you know, taking leadership, owning their power, becoming stronger members in our society is such an inspiration to me. I've heard a lot of ladies and gentlemen, guys and girls, and you're missing a whole category of non-binary people. One of the things that you could say, guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Sitting up there with kids my own age and having Ilyasa just up there like asking us questions and actually wanting to hear our voice. It's such a rare experience. You can't not just feel empowered and excited and just heard for like the first time in like your uh, teenage years, you know? There are small cues in your language that you can change to make us feel valid and heard. It is wonderful to see them with such compassion and care and willingness to make a difference, and I applaud any young person that's doing that. Respect and engage students in a way that allows them to be a part of the lesson. Opening a discussion with teachers on how to move forward is the best possible way to make any progress, you know. It's easy to complain about issues in the classroom, but it's better to actually vent the issues, but then try to find a solution. And I feel like this event worked towards a solution to the issues in classrooms. Really engaged students. The very first adults that you'll meet that aren't your family members are teachers. They will be the first people teaching you new things and opening up the world for you. Young people, future leaders, thank you so much. This has really been very informative. Excellent. In a little while, we'll head back to the NJA convention. But first, how Unavoidable Distraction launched a learning opportunity rooted in iconic Americana. I give you the lemonade stand. Okay. I have a lemonade. Okay. This isn't a traditional lemonade stand. It wasn't erected on the front lawn to pass time on a hot summer's day and earn a few shiny nickels. This lemonade stand is an experiential learning project created by teachers to help students grow. Can I help you? Thank you, you so say? much. What you say? We have social skills, we have language skills, academic skills, working on fine motor skills, gross motor skills. We work on all of those things so that they can become as independent as they can be. The inspiration for the lemonade stand actually came from a challenge to the learning environment. Where my classroom is located is very near the parent pickup line. By 2.30 in the afternoon, parents were lining up to pick up their children, but dismissal isn't until 3.10. So the children were becoming distracted. And so after about a month or so of that, we said, well, can't we do something to turn this distraction into learning? And so we came up with the lemonade stand. So why are we here right now? What are we going to talk about? Charlie, the lemonade stand. We've been working towards the goal that says, I can run a lemonade stand. And they are always looking for unique ways to meet the needs of their students. And I don't think you get any more unique than, than this one, something that was a distraction that they turned a, a negative into a positive. We began in the very beginning talking about social skills, looking at people, giving good eye contact, using language, using our words. Uh, some of the children have some difficulty with language, so this has helped to build their language skills. We talked about what is a business, talked about advertising, and we talked about our product, what our product would be. 
Sure. We also incorporate academics such as mathematics because we're counting money. They have to learn how to keep their hands clean because we're serving food and we talked about germs and how we don't want to spread them. So we incorporate a little bit of everything. Everybody ready? One, two, three. I definitely believe the best lesson is just the social aspect. I have seen these students grow so much just verbally and being able to say what they need, what they want, going up to strangers and just saying to them, would you like to buy some lemonade? They're being introduced to new words and they're using them in their everyday language. They're talking to people in the hallways saying, hey, we have lemonade on Friday. Do you want to be a customer? They're using it in their writing, talking about lemonade stands and lemons, using words such as sour to describe different things. Their adjectives are improving and increasing. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Come along in. Whenever you want to. <laughs> have a nice day. In putting together uh, projects such as this, you have to think about the needs of the learners. They have vast abilities. Many of them have different needs different equipment that they'll need. So we have to think about how we can incorporate all of the children so that everybody can be involved. Here you go. The stand had been out there a few weeks before we opened up to sell because we were in the process of painting and all of those things. So the day that it was time to sell, the kids I think were so excited it just drew the people over to them. And I think we made $100 the first day. <laughs> Money from the lemonade stand goes to the John O'Day Special Education Fund, which helps pay for learning experiences outside the classroom. We might want to go to the boardwalk. Okay, Charlie. To the zoo. We want to use the money to take the children on trips in the community where they can use their language skills and their social skills so they could read the menu and order for themselves and pay for their meals and make sure that they get the proper change back. We want to work some of their gross motor and fine motor skills so we take them bowling and other places that they'll be able to use those skills as well. My favorite part of the Lemonade Stand Project is just seeing the kids' excitement. And then not only do they get excited, their friends get excited for them and they just cheer, it's your week for the Lemonade Stand. and it's the light of our Friday. We enjoy it so much. Running the lemonade stand is one of the most exciting things for them to earn and that's been the most enjoyable thing I think for me. It just lights up their eyes. Yes I would. It is very rewarding to see the children come together to plan it, to see it followed through and to see the results of it. They get to take a trip realizing the rewards of their labor. Come again! Coming up, the brain-body connection, learning through movement, after this. I teach a kindergarten classroom. I'm really big on um, making sure we follow our schedule. Uh, we take a lot of, it's called brain breaks. This researcher, Dr. Jean, she kind of came up with that. And what you do is you might take five minutes and we'll dance. We'll watch like a little um, educational video on YouTube. We might go around. I have some things like we pass around and we might answer like a question. Something to kind of get them moving and focused again. I really try to teach them how to be responsible and accountable so that they kind of instill that upon their classmates. And I know that sounds crazy for five-year-olds, but they do it, like they're amazing. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our Friday morning plenary session. And it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Mike Kazawa. Thank you very much. I hope that you are willing to do some movement today with me. And I'm gonna ask you all to take your left hand and grab your nose. Mike Kazala has a unique way of getting people involved in his presentations. And when I say switch, I want you to take the ear hand and go to the nose. They'll do that with me, just like this. Just as a simple little brain break. Switch. Mike is a leading authority on using movement and understanding the brain-body connection in the educational setting. 
I try to impress upon teachers that you know, from the brain's perspective, uh, learning does not happen from the neck up. It happens from the feet up. I want to help you understand the brain-body connection and how that's in play in your life and in the lives of your students every day. And so and that's all about managing state, the brain-body emotional states of your learners. And that's just, I can't overestimate its importance. Mike is the author and co-author of several books which focus on the benefits of movement and physical activity in the classroom. Prior to his writing career, he taught music and proudly comes from a family of teachers. A teacher's job is about long-term memory. There are two criteria for getting things to store in long-term, and that is, is it meaningful? Does it make sense? And meaning is the more powerful. It has emotion wrapped around it, so meaning is a critical part of school. Meaning making is state dependent, meaning how I feel during learning is critical to my meaning creation. You've sat in sessions, correct, when you watched a PowerPoint the entire time. I'm not against PowerPoint, I'm not against lecture, obviously I'm doing it right now. But you probably had a need to move. And so think about your kids that you're working with every day. They have that same need. So if you have a kid who is, they're yawning, they're bored, and their body shows it, I'm imploring you to stop what you're doing. Stand them up and give them a brain break. Something. Their fitness life is important to their academic life. And we just don't think that way culturally, but we need to begin to. And it's, it has started and it's, it's, it's growing, but it's slow. Teachers can be role models. I'm gonna show you some simple ones. I just want you to touch your opposite knee. Great, now if you can, I want you to use your elbow. I'm not saying kids should be moving all the time in the classroom, but when you can, and when you have the opportunity, when you feel it's you applicable, it, you, you know, give them that opportunity because this is probably the most powerful learning tool we have. This is an oldie but goodie. You may know this one. Face your partner. Put your right palm in the air. Just like this. Look at me. Palm up towards the ceiling. Take your left pointer finger and put it in the palm of the person across from you. When I say go, I want you to simultaneously take your pointer finger out of the person's palm and try to grab your partner's finger. Ready, go. I told you I come from a family of teachers and I will tell you that teachers cheat. I can say that. And I see this. The goal is for them to leave with a a renewed sense of urgency about physical activity in the classroom and also quality physical education uh, for academic achievement, for coming to school more, and for being in the principal's office less. The research just bears that out consistently. Everybody in this room should have this in their library, and it is called SPARK. The subtitle is The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain, and it's written by a gentleman named John Rady. He's an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard. He's a psychiatrist, uh, and he sees exercise as medicine. And we live in a culture of sitness versus fitness. And John Rady says we're literally shriveling our brains because of it, because we're built to move. One in three kids born in the year 2000 will become a diabetic, a type two diabetic. And that number rises to one in two if they're African American or Hispanic. It's a crazy statistic, and it's just uh, life altering. We need as educators to show them that movement, being physically active, being physically fit is important to our academic life and just important to our life. It's who we are, it's hardwired in our DNA. And I hope you have a better idea about how to go about using that in your classroom and the reasons why. Thank you so much, you've been a fantastic audience. I think more teachers today are using some form of movement. Think about how you can use it on a, a regular basis. Movement and physical activity create a motivated environment. It creates a motivated student. In turn, it creates a more fun job for the teacher. And it's just a, a powerful motivational tool uh, in the classroom. It's one of the top byproducts of what I call creating a kinesthetic classroom. You're watching Classroom Close-Up New Jersey. 
Cole is going to teach you your colors today. When I started working with him, there was very little language, and Cole was becoming more and more isolated. You have to follow their excitement and interests. It makes sense to have a native user of the language, a native member of the culture, working with a baby to give them language. And Cole's the first baby in New Jersey to have a deaf paraprofessional working with him within the early intervention system. So that has been amazing. This is called a hive, correct? Open up the top, pretend. These are new bees. Thousands and thousands of little worker bees in there. Pop them in there, pretend. We're popping them in. Pop them all in there. What are they making with the nectar? Honey. Honey, right, they're making honey. I teach experiential science program. I have a flower shop class, and I also teach what we consider to be a science two, which is biology. Today, our lesson was on beekeeping. Going over with the students a little review, uh, first, of what to look for in the hive. A hive inspection is what we call it. The honeybee is actually, if you didn't know this already, is New Jersey's insect. Now we have to place our little queen in here too. She's in here in this little box. The bees smell her in there. What do we have to do for now? We're gonna cover up the hive, correct? How long are we gonna wait, everybody, before we open it again to see if the queen's healthy and doing well? Two to three weeks. Good job, right. The population of bees is going down really fast because people don't understand how important they are. So like all the trees and flowers and all that wouldn't really be growing if the bees weren't here. Everybody needs to know about it because we wouldn't have fruits, vegetables without them. And honey, everybody likes, a lot of people like honey. They're all female bees. I've been a beekeeper for 10 plus years now. My whole point in bringing the program to the school was to make them environmental ambassadors and they've really grabbed a hold of it. And they're learning more and more, and they're learning how important it is to our environment. I've learned that over one third of the crop's population is uh, pollinated by bees, which I found really a shocker, because I knew that bees pollinated crops and all that, but I didn't know they pollinated that much there. Topanga and I are gonna go out later, and we're gonna put another box on top, another super on top. What's that one gonna hold? The honey, right. The honey that we're going to leave for them for the winter, correct. After that little introduction, the kids go over how to remind how to put on their suits, and they practice putting on the suits and making sure that they're being proactive and covering up. So are we ready to go out to the hives now and do our inspection? We go into the hive, um, certain people have certain jobs. One person has a tool to open it up, one person uses the smoker to calm them down because of the aroma that they give off. Try not to be afraid of them. They're more afraid of you than you are them. This super that you're looking at is what we call the honey super. So there's the honey, huh? This is fall now, and there's a possibility that you might be seeing this in the winter time. I just want you to know that the hive never goes to sleep. It does not hibernate. Um, what happens inside the hive is that they will cluster together around their queen and they will travel around as a cluster to feed on the honey that's left behind. They will work very hard and use a lot of energy all winter long to keep that, by, by moving their wings, to keep that hive at about 90 degrees. If you are a good beekeeper, if you think naturally, you know you need to leave so much honey behind, 80 pounds or more, for that colony to survive over winter. How do they make the honey? They, it's kind of gross actually if you think about it. They throw up in the, each other's mouths. Okay. And then eventually they'll put it into one of these. Okay. The comb. So. And then they all flap their wings to get the moisture out. And then wow. there's honey. When they were finished with that, uh, they decided we were going to come back into to the classroom with some frames that we needed to extract. We had a few extra frames that we wanted to um, extract to bottle up the honey. You would take a knife and you would go not too far in, but not too far out. You just get the wax off the honey cells, get all that off, and then put it to the extractor. 
Sierra's gonna do a little spin here to force the honey out of the cells. All the honey now is out of the frames. So we're gonna open up the honey gate. The only process that this is going through is that strainer that's collecting all the wax particles and any pollen that may have still been in those frames. This year, we probably took about 350 pounds off of our four hives. Now all the money that we make all goes back into the program. That's what keeps our program running. Most people think they don't really like bees just because they sting, it hurts, but like it's, pretty awesome when you figure out more about bees. I care more about bees than what I used to. It's just great to learn. It's something new that you should try. Take Julian's advice. We should all care more about bees. If you're interested, a good place to start is the New Jersey Beekeepers Association, who just held their annual winter meeting. They'll host another meeting in the fall. We'll put a link in the video library on our website, classroomcloseup.org. Next time, We'll visit a classroom where students have a conversation with the last surviving Nuremberg Trials prosecutor. It's a must-see moment. We're happy to share. I hope you'll join us. So until then, for Classroom Close-Up New Jersey, I'm Sean Spiller. See you soon. Bye. I can say that.